Senator Joe Pittman is on the line with us. Our conversation this morning is brought to you by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. Good morning, Senator. Todd, good morning to you. Good to have you with me. I'm going to give you a line here today. Um, This line is uh, spoken by Governor Tom Wolf on May the 12th. The passage of the uh, amendments, the constitutional amendments having to do with pandemic restrictions are, his quote, futile gestures aimed at a crisis that has passed. End quote. That being the case, why did he renew the emergency declaration again yesterday? Well, I think there was some practicality to this, Todd. And I have to say I appreciate the fact that the governor is now understanding the need to collaborate with us on how we move forward. And obviously the that disaster de- declaration was expiring just as the primary occurred. And he renewed it so we could have a conversation about how best to unwind this over the next couple weeks. And what I mean by that is he has done some good things throughout this process, albeit unilaterally. And some of those are waivers toward licensing requirements and renewals and things of that nature that are valid and worthy. And so we do need to take some time to evaluate all that and unwind this in the right way. But the overall takeaway to this is that he no longer is going to continue to renew the disaster declaration at his whim. And more importantly, and I think we've lost some focus on this, is that this affects any future governor. And one of the biggest concerns that I have had, regardless of party affiliation, is that any governor could walk in on his or her first day in office and declare an emergency declaration on almost anything. And the precedent that had been set up until Tuesday basically indicated that the governor could then do whatever he or she wanted whenever they wanted. And that needed to stop. So that being the case, and uh, maybe a, a renewed focus on collaboration in Harrisburg, and we hope that is going to be the case moving forward, uh, This is uh, the constitutional amendments are things that apply not just to this emergency disaster declaration uh, in particular, but to um, having everybody who can be involved in a process and who can have some input on it um, inside, the, inside the process and not locked out. Right, and we set the 21-day standard because if we've looked historically at emergency declarations and the original intent for natural disasters, that is a reasonable time frame in, when, in which decisions could be made on declarations, both at the governor's office as well as within the General Assembly. And it gives us certainly the ability to continue declarations whenever we come together and determine it's in the interests of the Commonwealth. And so I think this is a good thing overall. I have been encouraged in these last 48 hours by how the governor has reached out. I know our leadership are um, encouraged by those conversations as well. And I think he did set a tone when he made this renewal and made it clear that we are going to have to work together on a path forward. As you got into the polling booth on Tuesday, uh, were you, like many people, um, looking at that question and saying, what does this question actually asking me to vote on? It well, was... you know, I've read them so many times before going into the polling booth that I, I didn't read them yet again. But I will tell you, as I went through the precincts of Indiana County on Election Day, I visited 25 or so of them. And I had a lot of people asking me, even as they were walking in, what does this mean? It was very convoluted. A lot of people skipped over them. People voted no because they didn't understand them. But I think the fact that at least 52% of the electorate approved these amendments, as convoluted as they were, demonstrate how frustrated the electorate was at how this pandemic has been managed over the last 15 months. As we talk about unilateral powers, there's a whole other issue, and that is the Reggie uh, compliance uh, or the Reggie uh, effort by Governor Wolf to join Pennsylvania to the uh, the compact of states uh, that is going to be so harmful to Indiana County. You had a rally at which you uh, spoke. Uh, you were participating in that earlier this week, having to do with the regional greenhouse gas initiative. Uh, and then it was either the next day or the day after 
uh, that the environmental or Department of Environmental Protection uh, passed another approval of the Reggie regulations. Uh, let's visit that issue again. Uh, first, uh, the rally at which you spoke the other day. Well, it was a very strong bipartisan show of support for the needs of Western Pennsylvania. As I said at that rally, we have set the standard in how to use our natural resources and use them in an environmentally sound way. As we've talked before, the coal-fired power plants in this area are stressed in the marketplace. There's no doubt about it. They're in a fragile state, but they're in a fragile state because of natural gas. And we've been able to develop our natural gas resources, get them to market in a very efficient manner. We've been able to extend the life of these coal plants through emissions controls. We have done all of this in a proactive way. We've reduced carbon emissions. And when you look at the global issues, the problem of carbon emissions is not here in Pennsylvania. It's really not even in the United States. It's across the ocean. That's where the issue is. And for us to punish ourselves for the actions of other nations, to me, is just illogical. And what we're again saying to the governor, similar to what the voters said on Tuesday, is that you cannot enter such a compact unilaterally. And if you look at the legislation that Representative Struzzi and I have introduced, it does not say that we cannot join Reggie. It simply says if we're going to go down that path, here's the framework and here's how you involve the legislature and more importantly the public in the process. And that has been what we've been missing for the last 20 or so months. And it's been the case uh, for other governors uh, in in other issues as well. And, and that again becomes an issue of unilateral powers and whether somebody uh, sitting in the governor's office has really the moral right to move forward with something that's going to affect people for the rest of their lives and maybe destroy an entire industry. Uh, in, in this case, uh, it is is that particular industry with the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, but really it could be any issue. Well, sure, and, and that goes back to what we talked about earlier and the importance of those constitutional amendments and bringing rebalance to co-equal branches of government. And, you know, if you, again, look at the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, all the states have entered legislatively, with the exception of New Jersey. And what happened in New Jersey is they were in, they were out, they were back in. And to me, that is not the way to establish policy. We either make a decision to join the compact or we don't. And it should be a binding decision. But this governor is 18 months away from leaving office. That is a certainty, and there will be somebody that replaces him, and their philosophy could be entirely different than the one of of his, and they could undo it all. But my concern is the damage is already being done because of the deferred maintenance on these plants, number one, but number two, it it will be too late, Um, and that's what really concerns me. One other thing with Senator Joe Pittman this morning, we had uh, from the Homer Center School Board uh, conversation uh, as they were talking about uh, meeting with you and Representative Struzzi about school funding and uh, how we can uh, ease a real burden on that particular district, but uh, apply school fair uh, funding for for everybody. Uh, And they said that there's a a chance, a good chance that they'll be able to go to Harrisburg and meet with some folks. Uh, That issue is a really big one, isn't it? It is a big one, Todd, and the problem we have is we have 500 school districts in this Commonwealth, and everybody's definition of fairness in funding is different. And if you if you look at the biggest picture, many of the school districts in our area receive more than half of their funding from the state, which essentially means other parts of this Commonwealth subsidize our schools. With our declining enrollment, and the way school funding is calculated, as our enrollments continue to to decline, the allocation of resources per student increases. And, you know, we could spend uh, an entire segment on how we've gotten to where we are in funding of schools, but it goes back to the mid-'90s when we used to fund schools on a per-pupil basis. We don't do that anymore. 
and we treat schools as if their enrollment is frozen back in the mid-90s. And if you look at the challenge Homer Center has is that their enrollment has actually been more stable than their neighbors. And when you look at that in a per-pupil basis, it throws the equity of that out of whack. Uh, I'll do everything I can to support Homer Center. Obviously, everything they do is in the shadows of Reggie right now and the future of the Homer City Power Plant. But if there is a way that we can recognize that you know, their enrollment has actually been stable or more stable than their peers, and that that has thrown their per-pupil allocation out of whack, I'm happy to do it. But it's a very difficult thing because you're dealing with 500 pieces of the puzzle, and when you start changing one piece, it ripples into the rest. Yeah. And that's what we have to be careful about. That is a difficult puzzle to put together, but uh, thankfully it's your job and not mine to do it. <laughs> Senator, yeah, I'm happy to have that. <laughs> Senator Pittman, thanks so much for being with us today. All right, Todd. Have a good day. You too. We'll see you. Have a good day. You too. We'll see you.